as I say, I'm delighted to have our local MP, Carol Monaghan, who would love to say a few words to us tonight. Carol. Thanks very much, Geraldine. And it's, I, I can't believe now, this is someone else's joke, but there are more people in this hall than there were at the Lib Dem conference. So, so it's fantastic to, to have such a great turnout on a Friday night. I know, obviously, after a week at work, everyone's shattered. So, so good to see so many of you here tonight. Um, Philippa Whitford, many of us know well. I knew her as a, or know her as a colleague, but I actually knew her during the Yes campaign of 2014 where she gave a series of talks, including here in Glasgow, which was great. Um, so it's, it's wonderful when you know people and then they end up being your colleagues. John I didn't know before I went to Westminster, but we bonded over a gin and tonic on a flight home <laughs> one night, and we talked, about, we talked about the architecture of Glasgow, in particular the tenement buildings. John and I share a great love for the Glasgow tenements. And one of the reasons for that is uh, John's family are from White Inch, the Martin Road in White Inch, and he spent a lot of his childhood there. So this is an area John knows very well. Of course, usually now when you spot him around this constituency, it's down at the auction in White Inch. So um, <laughs> we usually see him there on a Saturday. So it's, it's brilliant to have both John and Philippa and all of you here tonight. Um, I'm going to pass to John. John now spends a lot of his time on talk radio and I particularly enjoy it. It gets me on regularly to talk about science, but I particularly enjoy whenever he spends his time on talk radio um, winding up Tories. So I'll pass on to John. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Carol. And thank you to everybody for coming. It's an extraordinary uh, turnout. I was going to make that joke about the Lib Dem conference, but uh, you've made it for uh, you've made it for me. Um, as Carol says, I've known this constituency for a long time because my 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 family actually lived in Dumbarton Road for more than a hundred years, number fourteen twenty seven and number fourteen fifteen. So, my happiest early childhood memories were getting the bus from the south side to the Helaman's Umbrella, changing, and then the bus that went along Dumbarton Road and getting closer and closer to the White Inch Emporium, which meant it was my grandma's house, and I could run upstairs, and she always had biscuits and cheese, which I understand is a very posh middle class thing. I'm told on Twitter that uh, if you're a proper Corbinite, you don't eat cheese. Did you read that on Twitter this week? That's apparently, it's a sign of being a member of the spoiled bourgeoisie, if you have an empire biscuit. So my grandma was one of White Inch's worst class traitors and I'm ashamed just to think of all those biscuits that she ate, ate, ate against her class interests. Um, one of the joys about becoming a uh, Westminster MP, and there are not many, uh, but one of the great joys, and I was, I was never very sure whether I'd want to be an MP because I spent my life as a political journalist on Newsnight and on the record and various programmes and I always thought that I'd be too disobedient to be an MP. I thought I'd be too naughty. I thought I'd always want to defy the whip and not do what I was told. So I, I always thought the discipline element would be the hardest thing. Well, imagine the joy of finding myself elected with 55 of the naughtiest people <laughs> I've ever met. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people say to me, What's the mystery? Why do SNP MPs not break the whip? Because remember when we first went down to Westminster, remember the big stushy that there was because, you know, we went down and uh, Marie Black had the eight chips, which is appalling. Um, <laughs> they were known to sit with some of the staff rather than with other MPs, absolutely revolting. And the Daily Mail was filled with headlines. How will Nicola control these hooligans, these barbarians at the gate who have arrived at Westminster? Now, you remember that that critique changed seamlessly within a matter of months to they're all robots entirely obeying Nicola Sturgeon. They've got implants planted. And it was one of the many absurdities of the coverage of the new parliamentarians in 2015 that none of the journalists 
who criticised us for being hooligans, were remotely embarrassed at the abrupt vault fast that they did when they complained that we were robots. And, and the truth is that actually what brought us all together, I think, was the fact that none of us had ever been interested in a political career. We'd all done other things. Uh, Dr. Philip had dabbled in medicine, I'm told. <laughs> Um, and uh, Cal, of course, uh, was uh, much loved in the constituency as, as a teacher. But they'd all done different things. I think it was Kezia Dugdale who said they really looked like Scotland. You know, we had a student, we had a couple of pensioners, we had crofters, we had engineers, we had journalists, we had lawyers. And I think Angus Robertson played a blinder in the front bench positions that he gave to each of these people because you know what it's like if you're a cabinet minister you're um, often taking on a role at a job that you know absolutely nothing about because <laughs> well Northern Ireland being a prime example <laughs> Kirk, <coughs> Kirk Northern Ireland secretary was astonished to discover that Roman Catholics don't vote for Ian Paisley now <laughs> my other half's Brazilian and I thought am I being unfair to her and I said to him did you know about this and he let the dogs in the street in Rio know this. How is it possible that a Northern Ireland secretary doesn't uh, know this? But of course, uh, Angus, who was a, a fabulous uh, leader and a very nice man, he chose people who knew uh, about their area and he put them into front bench positions. Now I should tell you that we'll be going on to questions afterwards. So you'll have lots of opportunity to ask I'm sure Carol, if you'd like to answer questions, I'd certainly be happy to answer questions of Dr. Philippa. But in Dr. Philippa, he chose a star. Uh, Dr. Philippa knows about health. She's been in the Gaza Strip. She's a cancer specialist. Uh, she certainly learned a lot more about English health than I think she knew uh, previously. She made friends with the young uh, hospital doctors who were petitioning Parliament for justice. She was only one of the spokespeople who could go out and actually talk to them at the gates. And I've said this before, one of the great joys of uh, health questions when Jeremy Hunt was the Secretary of State <laughs> and Dr. Philippa stood up was the beats of sweat on his upper lip because he realised he was about to confront somebody who actually knew what she was talking about. Um, so without further ado, uh, and I'm sorry it's in the context of Brexit because I've heard Dr. Philippa speak about working in Palestine, which is an extraordinary tale when she tells it. But tonight the focus is on Brexit. We're about to fall off a Brexit cliff edge. What I heard today that tiny Luxembourg and Malta and Estonia are discussing Scotland's long-term future and Scotland's unable to discuss or play a role in our long-term future and influence. And this afternoon we hear that uh, we may not even be allowed in the EEA because Iceland doesn't want us to be in the EEA. Who could doubt that our current union is not working in the best interests of Scotland. So let's find out a bit more, not just about Brexit, but about health and Brexit, with the wonderful Dr. Philippa Whitford. He's such a pattern merchant, isn't he? <laughs> I've probably got one of the wee British Airways things in my handbag. I'm always getting caught <laughs> with the bottle they gave me the week before. Um, anyway, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, obviously, as has already been said, it's incredible to see so many of you here on a Friday night. <laughs> Put a few wee drops in. <laughs> Basically, you're a bunch of saddles. I mean, really? Your social life is that bad that you're in Knightswood Secondary on a Friday night? I'm really feeling quite sorry for you. <laughs> anyway, obviously, Brexit and health. Now, unfortunately, and I apologise in advance, and there should probably be a health warning, um, that people may feel depressed, suicidal, worried at the end of this talk. And I do apologise for that. 
Because in the run-up to the referendum in 2016, my little videos online, my articles and the talks I gave were positive. It was saying to people, please be aware of what you've been getting from Europe. Don't throw it away. Because before the referendum and indeed since, all the talk is about trade and customs and business. And people are still walking around going, ah, I just turn the telly off when someone mentions the B word. I don't run a business. It won't affect me. Unfortunately, Brexit's actually going to affect everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you need. And this is just focusing on some of the health impacts because they will impact on all of us. We all use the NHS. We all have health issues at some point in our lives. And it's really important that we understand what's at threat here. Now, the number one and the first thing that you might notice or the first thing you might be aware of is workforce. Workforce is the biggest single challenge faced by all four UK health services. We're all struggling. Now, in England, it's eye-watering. They have 41,000 nursing vacancies. It's two and a half times the vacancy rate of Scotland. And if any of you work in the health service, you will know how pressurised your nursing colleagues or maybe nursing friends feel in the NHS in Scotland at the moment. Imagine having two and a half times that nursing vacancy rate. And yet, of course, what's happened since the referendum? A 90% drop in European nurses registering to come and work in the UK. It just literally went straight off a cliff. And they're surprised why. All that talk, I mean, her, herself calling European citizens queue jumpers. All that talk during the referendum about migrants and how people come here. I was on a delegation to Berlin in the autumn of 2016 with a group from Westminster. And they were talking about, oh, the problem is freedom of movement and European migrants. And one of the senior German politicians said, all right, okay, we wouldn't consider other Europeans as migrants. We would consider them as citizens. So that would be like us being called Scottish migrants in London. I have to tell you, I grew up in Belfast, and when I first came over here, that's exactly what it was like. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish. We've moved on. But so has Europe. Europe doesn't consider people from different parts of Europe as different. Here in Scotland, it's not just health. We need people. It doesn't matter where they come from. Scotland is one third of the UK landmass, and most of it is hell of an empty. And the further north and west you go, into the highlands or out onto the islands, the proportion of doctors and nurses who come, particularly from Europe, but also from outside Europe, just gets higher and higher. So the vast majority of consultants <coughs> in the Western Isles Hospital, a quarter of all Shetland GPs, are European or non-European citizens who are working in our health services, helping to keep us well. Now the problem is, is if you look at their immigration bill that they plan to replace freedom of movement with, they're using this £30,000 as a definition of skill. Well, it's not a great definition of skill because the average Scottish wage is below that. Junior doctors are below that. Nurses are below that. Laboratory technicians are below that. Young graduates are below that. It's a completely useless definition of skill. And they've just agreed to allow in 2,500 seasonal workers for agriculture for the whole of the UK. That gives us 250 for the whole of Scotland. Now, last year, over a million pounds worth of fruit and veg rotted in the fields in Scotland. We need people, but we certainly need people in our health service. And we also need people in our social care service. There's a significant proportion, particularly from the Eastern European countries, who work in social care, looking after our, our parents, looking after someone with disability. You define that as low skilled, but how many people in this room could do it? Not all of us, I would like to suggest. So the problem is we have a workforce challenge already. We have created such a hostile environment that Europeans don't feel welcome so they're already not coming. And surveys by the British Medical Association and the GMC suggest that between a third and a half of European doctors 
are considering leaving and that are between 15 and 20 percent of them are already in the process of leaving. That's what we've done with Brexit. Drive out people we need in our economy, in our communities, and particularly in our health service. And when they go on about, oh, all these Europeans here are using our NHS, well, my husband who's perched down at front is German. He's worked in our NHS for over 30 years, and he's not alone. There's a bigger chance that you're actually queuing to see a German doctor or specialist or nurse than that they're keeping you away from a doctor. And the problem is when we don't have enough people, that actually messes up waiting times, messes up services. People think the NHS is all about big fancy hospitals and machines. It's not. Healthcare is delivered by people. Even if they use a big fancy machine, it's still people that diagnose you, people that operate on you, people that treat you, and particularly when you're ill, people who care for you. So that's the first big plan that's having an impact on us. Now drugs, obviously there's a lot more talk about this now because of the discussion about no deal and stockpiling and drug shortages. But this has been an issue that's been coming for ages. We will be outside the European Medicines Agency. Now it is an absolute example of what we've gained from Europe. It didn't increase bureaucracy, it decreased it. So all the drug licensing systems from all 28 countries work together to form a single agency so that new drugs go through one process and can actually be sold or prescribed right across Europe. So that means new cancer drugs get from the laboratory to the patient much quicker than they did before. And part of that is because new drugs are launched in Europe at much the same time as America because it's a market of over 500 million people. We're coming out of that. Other markets like Canada and Australia, they get their new drugs about six months to a year later on average. Some drugs, it's three or four years later. So that means that when there's new drugs around, they may not even be licensed for us to use them in the UK. Obviously, you'll have heard about things like stockpiling and so on. And the problem is actually shortages of drugs are increasing now. The drug shortage list for the NHS has increased from about 25 drugs normally, manufacturing problems, raw material problems, to about 160. And that has happened over the last six months. There's a hospital in England reporting that it's short of 300 drugs. And I think that's because of the creation of the stockpiles. You can only create stockpiles one of two ways. Either you increase production or you start taking stuff out of the current production. And I think that's what's largely happened. And one of the big concerns is it isn't the UK government who are stockpiling. They are making the pharmaceutical firms do the stockpiling. Prices are already climbing. Can you imagine the absolute mint they're going to make if we are in a situation of drug shortages? And what does that do? The NHS has to pay more for drugs, which means it's got less money to do other things. So even if we can get the drugs we want, the chances are that we're going to be paying more for them. I was in a debate on Monday about a piece of legislation they were trying to sneak through by a system where they just put it in the library for 40 days. And if nobody twigs it and complains about it, it's passed. And one of the parts of that, it's called a serious shortage protocol, meant that a pharmacist could change you to a totally different drug perfectly reasonable drug, a drug they would choose by best decision, but they can't see your records. They don't know you were on that drug five years ago and it made you have blackouts because they can't see your medical records. And the key thing was that they would have the right to do that without discussing it with your GP. The British Medical Association got a week to feedback to government consultation. The General Medical Council, they weren't even consulted at all. And this was going to be snuck through with no scrutiny and no debate. And it's things like this. Westminster is completely overwhelmed at the moment with all of the bits of quite dry, quite small print legislation you have to do. And things are being snuck through. And that's a real concern. And the problem is that many of us need medicines. And we don't particularly want our drugs being changed without knowing that our GP has been consulted. And that's the critical thing. The moment your pharmacist has to actually talk to your GP. 
Now, I think most of them will be quite sensible and they will still pick up the phone, but they've changed it in law. And you have to consider why. Well, I think it's quite simple. They expect there to be so many shortages that it would very quickly become impractical for the pharmacist to be phoning a GP every time. And all of that is concerning. And we've been raising these things, including the issue of radioisotopes, which are kind of radioactive materials, very low dose of radioactivity, but we use them in scans. Like insulin, which we don't make in the UK, we don't make any of these things. We import them all. And you can't stockpile. Any of you, if you remember your physics from school, you remember half-life. Every time you go through a half-life, you've only got half the radioactivity. So the half-life of the one that we use most of the time is less than three days. So if you've lost a day at Dover, and then you're trying to get out of the traffic at Dover, and then finally you get to a hospital, again, it may not have the dosages left that it would at the moment. We have a complex system of delivering these things out of Europe. The next one is the fact that we have the right to have health care in Europe. Any of you who are sensible, I hope you've all got the little EHIC card in your wallet, European Health Insurance card, means if you head off to, you know, Oktoberfest in Munich, have a wee refreshment too many, and fall down and break your leg, you'll be treated as if you were a German citizen. I think that's fantastic. Now, what's going to happen, and I'm having to do legislation on Tuesday, is to give power to the Secretary of State to begin negotiating reciprocal arrangements with 27 other countries. Actually, 30 other countries, because they'll have to negotiate it with the EEA countries as well. So we've been able to travel anywhere in Europe and have that. Our pensioners have had the right to go and live in the sunny climes in southern France and Spain, where they never paid any tax and transfer their healthcare rights from here to there. And again, even though they're aging, even though they might need more and more healthcare, they're treated as if they were a local citizen. Your European health insurance card even allows you to organize health treatment in advance that you need. So people on dialysis can actually go on holiday in Europe and arrange to have their routine dialysis three times a week. You tell me what health insurance company you can get an affordable package from, because I can't think of one of them. So these are the things that we're all losing, but for some individuals, the impact will be huge. The next one is research. European, the EU is the biggest single European, uh, the, sorry, the biggest single research network in the world. It's bigger than America, it's bigger than China. And we in the UK have really benefited from that. And in Scotland, we've punched way above our weight. We're about 8.5% of the population. We attract about 13% of the research grants. Now, what the UK government say is, well, we're, we'll, we'll put funding in. We'll replace what's lost. But it's not just about funding. It's about collaboration. You know, sitting in a muddy field on your own with your wee bag of money doesn't get you very far. It's the ability to work as part of a huge team right across Europe, whether it's nuclear physics or dementia or treatments for cystic fibrosis. It's actually allowing the best minds to collaborate and work together. And there's a new clinical trial system that is just starting out in Europe to make it easier, to make it slicker, to make it have a single point of contact for registering a trial, for putting data in and for analyzing it. We're going to be outside all of that. We're literally going to be the child outside the sweetie shop with our nose pressed to the window. And the last big one is public health and health and safety. And we all know that the Tories absolutely hate health and safety. It's always described as red tape. Cameron had his rule. One new regulation in, there had to be three out. Well, I can tell you, Europe has driven up our health and safety. Do you remember the adverts we used to get about children being burnt to death in nylon night dresses? Or choking to death on toys that the eyes came out of? Or chemicals in paint? When I was a young surgeon, it was absolutely ten a penny to have workers in with thermal burns, chemical burns, hand injuries, limb injuries. That was just part of, of doing any kind of manual job. 
And those things have changed. And I could tell you a lot of that, the workers' rights, maternity rights, the protection of workers has been driven by Europe. It's not been driven by Westminster. And they are also the ones who put the pressure on to clean up water, to clean up the beaches. If you remember last year or the year before when they were taking the UK government to court because of poor air quality, 40,000 people a year in the UK die because of poor air quality and pollution. And the only pressure was coming from the outside, was coming from Europe, saying you need to get on and do something about it. And I worry that when that pressure disappears, it will be back to, as is described by Rhys Mogg and his crew, you know, a low tax, low regulation country where business can thrive. Business might thrive. But actually, that isn't the important thing. It's that people thrive. And actually having green or turquoise rivers, having poisoned air, having stuff, more stuff washing up on your beaches, or having your children poisoned because cheap rubbish can be imported from somewhere, is not what any of us want. And another spin out for us in Scotland is the way Brexit is being used to hollow out the Scottish Parliament. They're not brave enough to shut it down. They know we'd make a huge noise, but they are just going to quietly hollow it out. We see that with what's called the power grab. The 24 powers that, yes, they sat at Europe, but Europe's all about a level playing field. Europe is very legalistic, black and white, 27 languages, no wiggle room. That's what Europe is about. But that's not what the UK is about. So if you look at what the powers are, fishing, agriculture, food standards, food safety, food labelling, geographical indicators like scotch, GM crops, environment, all of these things are clearly about selling Scotland to Trump in a trade deal. But absolutely the 24 powers you need to package up if you're going to sell us out. And the number one demand in the American trade papers is they want rid of geographical indicators. Their demand is the right to sell their whiskey as scotch. So how long are we going to actually hold on to that if that's what Trump is demanding? And our Prime Minister, Theresa May, needs to come back with that bit of paper in her hand. Trade in our time. That's what she's after. Won't matter what it is. And you might say, I'm not going to eat hormone injected beef or chlorine washed chicken, but they're going to take control over food labeling. So you may not know. So vegetarianism may be your only option to avoid it or grow your own. I think we should all start digging up our lawns and planting vegetables. So all of these things are about, about doing these trade deals and about bringing in substandard cheap food. What's that going to do to our agriculture industry? What it will, it, will it do to Scotland's famous food and drink industry? Whiskey and smoked salmon are not just Scotland's biggest exports for food and drink. They're the UK's biggest exports for food and drink. And it's based on their premium quality of Aberdeen Angus, of Scotch beef, of Scotch whiskey. And these are, this is a brand that is known worldwide. And they don't like it. So the problem is that's going to undermine our food and drink industry. And that is a threat to us. If you look at what's going to happen with these powers, as I say, Europe is all about a kind of boring level playing field. Everyone has to agree. It takes ages to get anything done because everyone has to agree. But in the end of the day, it is about everybody getting on board. Now, what we were demanding, the thing that led to the walkout in Westminster, was the one demand that the Scottish government had was that any UK-wide frameworks had to be agreed. Now, that actually sounds quite reasonable. But Westminster said, no, we are the sovereign parliament. We have the right to impose. So what's happening at the moment in the agriculture bill is Michael Gove has decided that there shouldn't be direct subsidy to farmers. Anymore. Well, that's great for him because England only has 17% less favoured land. Scotland has 85%. Wales, 81 Northern Ireland, 72 so the three devolved nations are predominantly wild land. 
So if we are faced with tariffs on land and no subsidy to farmers, what's going to happen to our hill farmers? What's going to happen to the land up north? How are we going to sustain the rural population? And that's exactly it. The decisions will be made by the UK government. So when they're all sitting around the table being nice, all four countries, there may be some things they agree on. But if they don't agree, the UK government, which will have been negotiating as England or on behalf of England, gets to stand up and go, tough. We are the UK government. We are making the decision. And that's the concern. While Europe's about a level playing field, the UK isn't. Europe would never have put the weasel words not normally into a piece of legislation. And the thing is, they won't shut the parliament down, but just bit by bit. We're hearing it about the, the idea of the replacement funds for all the money we get from Europe. The social cohesion funds, the regional development funds. But they're talking about maybe having a fund that instead of devolving Scotland's share, that it'll actually be they'll make local authorities apply to London so that they start to pull some of the power and influence back. And people have to remember, conservatives were completely against devolution in the first place. In the same way as people seem to forget the DUP were against the Good Friday Agreement. You know, a big red line across the Irish map would actually suit them fine. So it's important to remember the parties that are pushing some of these decisions, what their actual philosophy is. Now I know there's lots of people in Scotland who don't believe in independence, but the vast majority of people in Scotland believe in devolution. They recognise the things that we've been able to do in Scotland that are quite different from England and that we wouldn't have otherwise. And that is things like the baby box, the best start ground, our free early learning Childcare is quite different from what will be available in England. Free tuition for our young people, free personal care for our elderly. We're the only one of the four nations that provides free personal care, that can allow someone to stay in their home with some degree of dignity without going through things like means testing. All of those things are quite important and it's aimed at different parts of our population. But many of them won't even know that that's something special they get in Scotland. Because what does our media do? It's just NHS in crisis permanently. And yet the common phrase I hear from health charities when I'm in Westminster is, ah, but you're so lucky in Scotland. Because there are so many things that we have worked to make available here. And I don't just mean we, the SNP. I mean the Scottish government ever since we've had it, ever since we've had devolution. We went in a different direction. And in particular, we didn't go down the line that they've gone in NHS England of privatization, of outsourcing to <coughs> companies like Virgin Care, Circle, Capita. That is the driving factor down in NHS England. And it's become completely fragmented. And we are pushing to try and get them to reform some of those changes. But in actual fact, the power that they've now got that scares me the most is the power over public procurement. Now it's always at the bottom of the list of 24 and people ignore it because they go, oh, I don't know what that is. I know what fishing and farming is. I know what GM crops are, but I don't know what public procurement is. The UK government would now have the right to do to us what they did to their own health service. To simply stand up and say, the new framework for the UK is that all public contracts must be put out to tender. That's exactly what Section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act did to the English NHS in 2012. Now in Surrey there were six commissioning groups of GPs who'd had a contract out to Virgin Care and when it ended they said, you know, that wasn't very good. We're going to try and bring it back into the NHS. So they weren't breaking a contract, they were just deciding not to renew it and to actually bring the community services back into the NHS. Virgin Care sued them. Now, all six of them settled out of court. It is, of course, hidden behind commercial sensitivity. So you can't actually get the numbers. But one of the commissioning groups accidentally published that they had settled for over £360,000. 
So we know that the six together, because that was one of the smaller ones, was at least two million pounds. That's two million pounds not spent on knee replacements, cataracts, drugs, and other things. Two million pounds in the pocket of Virgin. We don't want that. We have turned away from that the moment we got the devolved powers. And it's really important that we are able to look at our problems. Scotland, particularly around Glasgow, we don't have good health, but it is improving. We used to have the rottenest teeth probably anywhere in Europe. But Child Smile, where we actually engage with babies before they even have teeth, has reduced rotten teeth in primary school children by 24%. In England, four out of 10 children under the age of five can't get a dentist at all. It's a totally different approach. Because if you invest in people, if you invest in them, particularly when they are children, you save money in the long term. If children have a better outlook, if they have early learning before they go to school, if they are well fed, if they are not living in homes that are on the edge of poverty, then actually they will learn, they will have a better chance in life. At the moment, 1,400 children a year across the UK die before they reach their 15th birthday. And they die because of prematurity, fetal alcohol syndrome, low birth weight, house fires, road traffic accidents, suicide. All of these things are worse in people who are growing up in deprivation. And what we're seeing at the moment is we're actually seeing child poverty rising. All the poverty for all the different population groups, pensioners, children, lone parents, have all been coming down. But now all of them are going back up. So one in five people in Scotland live in poverty. A quarter of our children are growing up in poverty. And would you believe we are actually the lowest poverty rate in the UK of the four nations? In Birmingham, it's one in two children are growing up in poverty. And the turn wasn't at the banking crash. The turn was in 2012, after the first Welfare Act. Because what have we seen? We've seen a benefit freeze. We've seen the third child excluded. We've seen money cut as people move on to universal credit. Poverty is rising, and poverty is the biggest single driver of ill health. So we can't turn that around. Scotland only controls 15% of welfare. You know, people like to say, oh, you've got control of welfare now. Sort it out. No, we don't. Scotland is getting control of a few benefits. One of them is PIP, personal independence payments. And they have changed the approach to try and approach people with disability in a way that gives them some dignity and isn't always hounding them to another examination and another interrogation. My first case that I dealt with as an MP was a patient of mine. And it, we had to fight for about three months to get her a lifetime award. And that was great. She was so grateful, fantastic. I got managed to get her sorted. Within three months, even though they'd given her a lifetime award, they were back saying, you need to come back for an assessment. The woman had advanced breast cancer. You know, show a bit of humanity. And that's what we want to try and do. And the problem is, you need the powers to do that. The way you tackle poverty, they love this phrase, making work pay. But that's not what universal credit does. It just makes social security not pay. If you're in social security, you're probably going to be destitute. Professor Philip Aston of the, of the UN, the Special Rapporteur on Poverty, was really critical about the fact that one and a half million people in the UK are absolutely destitute and that that number has increased. And he praised Scotland for the fact that we are trying to mitigate these things. But the Scottish government is spending over a hundred million a year on mitigating the bedroom tax and setting up the Scottish Welfare Crisis Fund to try and support people. But what that means is we're actually taking that money out of the Scottish budget and when we mitigate the bedroom tax, particularly because we're just paying it for people, so we're actually sending that money back to Westminster rather than individuals having to pay for it. But that's over 100 million that we could be spending on our schools, on our elderly, on our infrastructure, whatever. 
And unless you have the powers to actually make the real living wage, not the pretendy living wage that the Tories talk about, the real living wage, your minimum. You are not tackling poverty. At the moment, you know, we are paying the wages of people who work for Amazon and other big firms. That isn't right, but we don't have those powers. So we have the powers to deliver public services. We do not have the powers over our economy, over our investment, and over our ability to make sure that people earn a decent living. We invest in business startups. We invest in apprenticeships. We invest in getting companies up and growing. But when they start to do well, the corporation tax goes down the road. If more people are working, the bulk of the income tax goes down the road. If people are now not on benefits, it's the DWP that saves, not the Scottish government. Whereas when you control the whole circle, you can make it a virtuous circle. That you invest in people, they succeed, therefore they require less support, and they actually are bringing money back in tax so that you can do it again and invest in the next set of businesses. We need growth. We need people for that. And we need our growth to be inclusive. Everybody needs to share in the economy and to share in that. To share the pot, to have opportunities, to be able to be the best person they can be, live the best life that they could live. And in actual fact, we will have fewer people in prison. We will have fewer kids on drugs and alcohol. We will have more people working than what we have at the moment. And the problem is, at the moment, if we just decide to just keep going, immigration's not going to let anyone in, rural areas will depopulate, you know, turn out the lights if you live in the islands. What we're going to see is just managed decline of Scotland. That's the vision that's in front of us. And what we need to be doing is to be talking to people to realise we have to change that. Only independence can allow us to choose to stay in Europe. Only independence with all the powers can allow us to tackle the underlying poverty and deprivation that drives so much physical and mental ill health in Scotland. So people need to be reaching out to everyone around you. Now, I know people come on social media to me all the time. When's the date? When's the starting gun? Let's get going. It's not about the when. I mean, I don't envy our First Minister in trying to choose the moment. But it's about the why. And the why is what you should be discussing with every single person who is in your circle. Because it's one-to-one -one conversations. And that's where we are. This is the year of conversation. Because you know how we could get a Section 30 order? I'm just going to keep you guessing while I have a slug of water. <laughs> <coughs> the way we could get a Section 30 order is if you can get those polls sitting above 55 to 60 all the time. Because at the moment, when Ian stands up and says, Scotland must have a choice, Theresa May just goes, Scotland doesn't want an independence referendum. <laughs> so your job is to go out and show her that's wrong. So don't wait for some starting gun, because it won't be a two-year campaign the next time. They'll be lucky if it's six months. Now, those of you who were active in 2014, remember how long it took your group to print their first leaf. <laughs> okay? That means you're not even going to get one out before we would get to the point. You need to be working now the way you were working in August 14. Active, out, talking to people. Reaching out to people. Now, it's not about blaming people who voted no, and it's really important that you don't. I can tell you, that's not a good way to convert. <laughs> don't shout, don't swear, don't be nasty on social media. It just drives me bonkers when I see people on social media being unpleasant. You yes yet. You unions. Really, you think that's changing minds? Now, the person you're arguing with, they might be incredibly annoying. They might be talking absolute rot. But if you are rude back, all the other no voters who are following that thread thinks that's how you would speak to them. So if someone is putting up a fact that is incorrect, put the correct fact back. Do not shout on social media. 
Do not shout face to face. It doesn't make sense. We have to reach out to people who voted no, and many had very good reasons. You think of the fact that there were elderly people who were having their doors knocked and being told if it's a yes on Thursday, there's no pension next week. Now you imagine that you're a widow. You've no young relatives. You've nobody with an iPad to say, don't be silly, granny, that's nonsense. And that's your only source of income. You're telling me you would vote yes? No, you wouldn't. It was absolutely project fear. And in that last two weeks, it changed from project fear to project Armageddon. There's going to be no banks. All the supermarkets are pulling out. Scotland will have no money and no food. So don't be blaming people. Some of them, I'm sorry, we just didn't, we didn't convince them. That's our fault. We should be thinking about why we didn't convince them. We should think about what frightened people in 2014 and try and deal with that. Now the Tories and Labour, and of course we mustn't leave out the Lib Dems, they don't want Scotland to have any choice or any voice in this. And I understand there are people last time who simply voted no because it was the status quo. It looked easy, a big, bright motorway, no potholes, bright lights. I'm just going to stay in that because independence, oh, it's a bit of a country road, lots of trees, no idea where it's going. Let's just stick with the status quo. Well, I can tell you, this time it's a fork in the road. There isn't a status quo. It's either the upheaval and chaos of Brexit, and that doesn't just mean no deal Brexit. Even Brexit with a deal is an absolute mess that we do not want. Or you face the upheaval and change of independence. But if we decide to stay in the UK and face managed decline, you have to accept you're going to be bound and gagged in the boot of Theresa May's car, saying, that's fine, you take us wherever you want to go, off a cliff, into an illegal war, whatever, we'll just sit here quietly in the back. Or you climb into the driver's seat, you start making your own decisions, and you navigate down your own path. And to me, I know it's not going to be easy. I know it'll be hard work, but imagine being the generation that had the opportunity and the honor of delivering that for our children and our grandchildren, I think that's an amazing opportunity. We need to convince people, we need to get the chance to make that decision, and then we need to work really hard, get off our bahookies, roll up our sleeves, and build a Scotland all of us want to live in. Thank you. Um, I think they like that, Philippa. Uh, we're being live streamed by Independence uh, Live at the moment, and we're going to get some questions from folk who are watching, uh, also folk who are tweeting, and of course people in the audience as well. Uh, but uh, you, while you think about your questions, and Alan's going to go around and, uh, with the microphone and get people who want to speak, I was reminded, you know, because there are moments when you're an MP that really stand out for you, and uh, Dr. Philippa there was talking about PIP assessments. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know the impact that has on, on folk who are living with really serious health problems. I remember a woman coming to one of my surgeries and she was living with dwarfism. And she was this height. And she turned up in my surgery and she'd been awarded zero disability points. And I asked her what effect that was having on her day-to-day -day existence. And she said, well, her car was going to be taken away and she couldn't use the escalator in the subway because she couldn't reach the handrail. So the only way of getting up from the platform to the top was to scramble up on all fours. And she said she found that utterly humiliating. And she just sat and started to cry in the surgery talking about it. And of course, when she'd been asked, some questions by the assessors. She'd been brought up from birth to say, yes, I can. That's what her parents had told her all the time. Yes, I can. Say, yes, I can. Never say, I can't. You can do it. So when they say, can you walk the length of a football pitch? 
She would say, yes, I can. Of course, she could. Can you carry a box? Yes, I can. Of course, she could. She could do any of the things that she'd said, yes, that she could to the assessors. But it was blindingly obvious that she could. And I just noticed one little, or I should say, by the way, that I went and spoke for her at her appeal. Uh, the whips gave me a day off. I flew up to Glasgow, went to the city centre. And I went in and I appeared at her appeal. They were furious. <laughs> they were furious when I turned up, absolutely furious. But one of the things that they um, asked was, can you carry a box? And I said, well, what kind of box are you talking about? And he said, uh, well, you know, can you carry a, you know, can you carry a, a, a key train box? And I said, well, she's a clerical worker. You ask, I used to work in Tesco's as a student. You say, can she carry a, a big box of crisps? Of course she can't. Even if she was able to get her arms round it, she wouldn't be able to see over it and she'd fall down the stairs, the equivalent. And there was a box of Andrex on the table. I said, think of the scale of this woman's body. That's... That's the equivalent. She, yes, she can carry that, but she can't carry the box that you're talking about. Anyway, she won the appeal. And she got a car back, and I challenged David Cameron at Prime Minister's Questions over this issue, and I asked him if he'd ever been to a PIP assessment appeal. What do you think the answer was? Yeah. You know the answer. Tory MPs, you know, talking about uh, Section 30 orders, often would say to us, why do you guys want to pull out of the UK but you're so keen on the European Union. Well, why, why is one union okay and not the other union? And I'd always say the same thing. Can you imagine Boris Johnson's face if you told him that in order to hold a Brexit referendum, he'd have to go off to Brussels and beg for permission? I know begging in Brussels is now quite de rigueur for Tories. <laughs> um, but, but this was a year ago or two years ago. And I would also say to them, of course, when we're uh, talking about the role that we would have in the European Union, we'd control our own macroeconomic policy, our own defence policy, our own foreign policy, we'd have a seat at the UN. We have none of those things as part of this union. That's the difference between being Denmark in the European Union and being Scotland in the United Kingdom. There is no comparison. Should we get some questions? Would you please put up your hand, say who you are, and if you want to say who you represent, tell us that too. Gentleman with the red jumper in the second back row. Hello, uh, my name is Martin Allen, and I'll make an apology. First, I'm not a member of YES, I'm not a member of a political party. That's I've great. I've seen the, seen the actual... Uh, uh, thing on Facebook from my local MP and I assumed it was just a public meeting. I didn't realise it was organised by, by any political persuasion. Uh, it's an all-party group. It's an all-party grouping. Really That's the point. But, but my point is, so I'm going to be challenging quite a lot of what you're saying, Philip, to be honest with you. Yeah, congratulations for your work in Palestine and Gaza. Uh, and the first off, in relation to that, because equality doesn't have a gender or a religion or anything else. But you, but you mentioned quite a lot, but what you haven't mentioned at all is Maze Deal. And what you have mentioned is protection for European citizens, what Maze Deal provides that. Uh, you, you mentioned about the concerns about medical uh, transport up and down through <coughs> Europe. Maze Deal has that also. So I, I kind of find what you're saying jumping over the facts of Maze Deal. And I'm wanting to really understand is if that's got all the answers in it, what's the problem? Because Brexit. Is something that, as you know yourself, uh, if, if you do become an independent in Scotland, then in effect you'll be in the exact same position. You'll be out of Europe. Uh, that's a fact. You'll have that paper in, Scot uh, in the Scottish Parliament if you want to go and have a real look at it because I've read it. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to start at the end and work backwards. Um, obviously, I meet with uh, diplomats and others on a regular basis, particularly I'm part of the German uh, all party group in Westminster, and in actual fact, the chef de mission from the Spanish embassy, the uh, former German ambassadors, others, have all said very clearly, we are waiting to bring Scotland in. There's huge sympathy for the position that Scotland is in. Absolutely, you have to go through a process. I'm not saying that we wouldn't. 
But what they have made clear is that they would put Scotland through that process as quickly as possible. There was a march last Saturday in Berlin <coughs> supporting Scotland coming in. There was one in Dusseldorf at the beginning of 2017. There's been one in Amsterdam. There's huge support for Scotland going into Europe. So no, we wouldn't. Our aim would be going back in. And with the marine energy that we have, the oil that we have, etc., Scotland is a net energy producer and a significant energy producer for Europe. So there's no particular reason why we wouldn't go back in. With regards to Theresa May's deal, um, now don't be misled that her current deal on the table is checkers, because it isn't. Checkers was absolute cake and eat it. They'd obviously woken up and discovered all the good things like European Medicines Agency and, and had suddenly added them into a shopping list. They're not in her current deal. So we're still outside the research network, we're outside the European Medicines Agency. We are not part of any of that. Yes, there is some protection for European citizens, but I had a meeting at the DWP yesterday because I and other colleagues are actually having European citizens who are being turned down for universal credit now because they're saying you don't meet the habitual residency test. We have about 11 cases among us, predominantly women, who don't necessarily have a big long tax record. The lady I'm working for at the moment, 30 years she's been here, and yet she's been put through that. She's already had to go through mandatory reconsideration, she'll be going to appeal. So it, they may say that, and yes, there are some protections. It took a long time for us to move on from the best card we have and bargaining chips, but yes, there is protection for European citizens. But in actual fact, that is being laid down to try and protect European citizens and UK citizens in Europe, regardless of what happens. One of the big problems is that the word you will not find anywhere in her deal is frictionless. In the checkers, it was all going to be magic. We're leaving, we're not going to be part, we're not going to pay anymore, we're not going to have freedom of movement, but actually everything's going to work exactly as it is now. And this big list of agencies that are quite good we're going to be members of them. Well, no, we're not. We don't accept the European Court of Justice. That means you're not part of the European Medicines Agency. It doesn't have an associate membership. And if you look at the Irish backstop, which allows Northern Ireland to, in essence, stay in the single market for goods and the customs union. Now, I'm from Belfast. I'm delighted that they have that. But why is Scotland not? The compromise deal from the Scottish government on the 22nd of December 2016 was that either the whole UK should stay in the single market and customs union or Scotland should be allowed to. But they threw that out within eight weeks and although it has been resubmitted two further occasions, it's been ignored. The impact assessments that have been put out by the UK government are on checkers. They're not on her deal. If you've read her deal and it's a long read, what you will find is that external investment will be going to Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland fishermen will be able to fish here off the west coast and land it in Northern Ireland where they can export it into Europe with a 0% tariff on it. Our fishermen, if that fish is processed at all, it will rise from about 4% to 16%. Our smoked salmon, we knock Norway out because Scottish smoked salmon in Europe has no tariff. Norwegian smoked salmon has 13% on it. So Northern Ireland is getting a huge advantage over Scotland. And it is not frictionless. So no deal absolutely is a complete mess. But anybody who's involved in looking at her deal, the main thing you get by voting for her deal is 20 months of transition. Because it's a blind Brexit. The political declaration, which isn't law, isn't a treaty, was six pages and has now been padded up to 26 pages of waffle. It says things like, we'll try and work together to get a free trade deal. There is nothing. So we are jumping off a cliff out of Europe, hoping we knit a par parachute on the way down with no idea of whether they're even going to be aiming at the Norway Plus target, the Canada Minus target, or the World Trade Organization target. So that is the problem. There's absolutely nothing about where the United Kingdom is going. And that, combined with this obsession around keeping immigrants out, will absolutely destroy Scotland. Our working age population is already falling again. 
And all of our population growth in the next 10 years is predicted to come from migration. So if we have this obsession in Westminster with tens of thousands, which is still what the white paper is obsessed with, then that is going to be a problem for us. In all of these key sectors that I've talked about, but actually just people who are young enough to be working and paying tax and looking after our aging population. So I'm sorry, trees are made steel, and I'm obviously not alone. You know, I mean, there was nothing in history that has ever lost by as much as our deal. But I'm afraid, whatever impression you're being given of it, it is not some great deal. It simply isn't. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Carol to come on the stage as well, since we're obviously getting questions that are not just health related. Uh, but sir, I, th I think that's a very good question you asked. If I could just remind the hall that one of the big arguments, and I know in Eastern Bartonshire this played uh, in the referendum campaign, was if you want to remain in the European Union, the way to do it is to vote no to Scottish independence. But I have to say, the attitude in the European Union has changed dramatically since 2014. I sat in the Bundestag and I heard the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee in the German Parliament, Christian Democrat, one of Mrs Merkel's allies, who said to me, Scotland will gain faster and easier entry into the European Union than any other country in history. Why? Because they're desperate to have us as an ally. Highly educated population, well trained, Northern European, no corruption. They're absolutely furious. Well, by, by European standards, believe me, there's no corruption here. Um, they're absolutely furious that they were forced by a succession of British governments to accept Bulgaria and Romania, countries that weren't, they call them Club Med, countries that weren't ready uh, for European Union. Uh, and Mr. Major's government uh, and Mr. Blair's government did it very deliberately because they wanted to weaken the European project. And now Germany feels that it's stuck with countries that really haven't met the qualifications for European Union entry. Uh, meanwhile, the UK walks off in a huff. So they want a sophisticated Northern European country. So don't let anybody persuade you we won't get easy entry because we really will. Can I have another question, please? Yes, this uh, handsome gentleman in the third row. Thank you very much, John. You're only saying that because it's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Eugene Duffy, Vice Convener of Mulgai SNP branch. Regarding Section 30, I know it's drifting away, but it is very important. You did allude to it uh, in your address. Uh, Section 30, we're never going to get it. I'm sorry, I'm very, very pessimistic. My glass is half empty regarding Section 30, uh, looking at the overall picture of how we are treated. Is there any mileage at looking at the dissolution of the union? Uh, shall I put it to, to, to both then, please, Carol? Perhaps you explain, perhaps you explain for people who don't know what a Section 30 order is, what it is. Okay, for, for any election to happen in the UK, this Section 30 order has to be given by a um, UK Prime Minister. So that is an independent referendum, an EU um, a, a Brexit referendum, a general election, Scottish Parliament, any of this. Because what you're saying is you're triggering the Electoral Commission, you're also triggering lots of other agencies that all have to work uh, together in order for that election to take place. So that currently, the power of our um, elections is still something that's reserved to Westminster. So if we were going to have another independent referendum, we would need to have permission under a Section 30 um, agreement. So that, that's our Section 30. Um, is there, is there any merit? No, I don't think there is. I think we do need a Section 30. But I think there's other things. We can be very creative in what we do. We, it, it would be wonderful if Theresa May says, yes, that's, that's fine. Let's go ahead. Let's, let's, um, let's give you another go because we like to accommodate Scotland's wishes. Um, 
or we certainly like to ask Scotland's opinion whenever we do anything. So that that would be that would be great. Um, but what Philippa said earlier about improving the polls is really important because what we need to be doing is agitating. And at the moment, as a population, we're not agitating. We might be agitating each other, but we're not agitating Westminster. <laughs> and until we get to a situation where we're, we are really pushing as a people for that, I don't think there's really any pressure on Theresa May to allow it. So I think our, our real method into Section 30 is agitation. First of all, we need to talk to each other. We need to talk to our friends, we need to talk to our family, our work colleagues, everything else. We widen out the circle. Um, there's no point talking to the converted. We might, we might enjoy that chat, but I'm afraid we need to go wider than that. Um, we, and we start pressing that way. Civil unrest can do great things. quite sure what Carol means by civil unrest. <laughs> I think just the polls. You know, there's lots of people not thinking about it, not talking about it. Whatever you think, at the moment, what we're facing because of Brexit, whether with her deal, with a better deal, with uh, no deal, which is obviously um, a terrifying thought, is that we are at that crossroads. And Scotland should have exactly the same right of choice in actual fact, if they had paid any heed to the Scottish Government proposal, it would have helped them solve the Northern Ireland question, because there wouldn't have been a border in the Irish Sea. Scotland would have been in the Single Market and Customs Union as well. The border at Carlisle is one-third the length. It has one-tenth of the crossings, and you can put all the number plate recognition and CCTV to your heart's content. Nobody's blowing it up. I can tell you, having grown up in Northern Ireland, what started before was having to have police to protect customs officers, then having to have army to protect the police officers, and then having observation towers along the border, and having a third of the crossings. There's 275 crossings on the Northern Ireland border, and a third of them were blocked off with boulders. Now, at the moment, if you have a heart attack in Donegal, you're not going down to Galway, you're going to Derry. If you live in Belfast and your child needs heart surgery, they're going to Dublin. They have completely integrated health systems between, uh, particularly specialist health systems, across Ireland. I can tell you, if they ended up having to close down crossings to manage the border, the first time somebody suffers because they're delayed in an ambulance, there will be absolute mayhem. So, I mean, to me, we could actually have helped solve that problem, but they were so determined to not even read Scotland's place in Europe that the Scottish government produced. They had dismissed it in literally eight weeks. And here we are, right back, a week today is official Brexit day. And only now they talk about allowing Parliament to look at all of these options, leaving the EU but staying in the EEA, looking at a Canada deal, looking at a customs union on its own. Why didn't we get the indicative votes two years ago? Theresa May said she would consult across the House, and she would consult across the UK. She didn't. All we heard was, I have to keep my cards close to my chest. That's how you negotiate. Parliament was completely shut out. And only now, in the last week, she's talking about, oh well, we'll maybe give MPs indicative votes. And I can tell you, there's MPs, particularly in the north of England, who are having death threats every day, there are MPs in the north of England doing their MP surgeries with a police officer in the room. And yet, on Wednesday night, she said, I am on your side, making MPs the enemy of the people. Absolutely reckless statement. And I can tell you, there were some who were swithering towards her deal who are now not going to vote for it. The anger in the House, when it's actually her that shut Parliament out right at the beginning, and now she's trying to blame the EU, blame Parliament, blame everybody else. But I, what I would say is what I said before, is it's important that we talk about the why of independence, that you talk to your friends, that you talk respectfully with people. And that's how we'll actually move forward. Okay, let's have another question. Two hands up, I pointed there for us. So, yeah. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, my name is Andrina Stamper. I'm apolitical. I'm not a member of any party. I think my main frustration. Thank you for your health warning before you started, because I do want to reach for reason late. I think on the way out. Um, Please don't. My frustration is this is all about party politics. This is where the Westminster system is just falling apart. It's meaningless. I'm not wanting to play party politics. I want to play national politics, where you and I are the important people in this equation, and we're not at the moment. We feel powerless. We feel as if we've been ignored. Um, facts? What are facts? Who's issuing the facts? Which media do you believe? Where do you investigate your facts? Um, it's not about being disrespectful, it's about being totally frustrated about who is telling the truth, who should have a voice, and how are we going to change it in, what, nine days? Two weeks? Three weeks? Well, for three years? And Andrina, what would you like to see happen? I would like, somehow, people to rise up in the streets and actually say, enough is enough. We've all got to get out there and show our faces and let people see that we've had enough and we need to be heard. Uh, I'll, yeah, uh, I'll maybe take a, I might take a couple of questions um, and, and we can uh, incorporate them. I'll, I'll come to you just in a wee second, but just over there, the lady at the side there with the snazzy purple jacket on. Hello, my name is Katrina Clark. I'm actually in Falkirk and I am a political uh, activist. I'm in the SNP and have been for over 40 years. So believe me, a second referendum for independence for me has got to be on the agenda and no wonder when you consider the mess we're in right now. But I would like the MPs here and John as well to give the, uh, the audience a uh, where do we actually stand in future European elections coming up? Now, if Theresa May doesn't get a deal next week passed, which is unlikely, as we all know, uh, they'll not be extending. They'll be jumping off the cliff, as we all know. If she does get a deal passed, and we do extend our membership of the EU, where is the EU constitutionally with those elections looming? If we're still a member, should we, are we forced to hold these elections? I don't know. Very good and clear question. All right, so we've got... The first question was uh, from Andrina and what can we all do to be less party political and build up more consensus? And also a factual question there from Katrina, which is, uh, are we going to be fighting European elections shortly? Well, how does the timetable look? Who's, who's going to start? Andrina, thanks very much. In, in, in terms of party politics, I can assure you and, and say very publicly here that we have tried everything. We have tried, we have talked to Tories, we've talked to Labour, we've talked to Lib Dems, we've worked, we're willing to work with anyone to try and get some sort of solution here. The problem is the Prime Minister is not willing to listen. There's, other, there's another problem in the, the Labour Party, I'm sure what they're doing. Um, but but it's, it is an issue, and there are many MPs who are working across party basis. In terms of consensus, the Scottish Government has also put forward compromises. Scotland voted to remain, but the Scottish Government came and put forward compromises that wouldn't necessarily suit Scotland, but would suit Scotland an awful lot better than what we're in just now. But these have been ignored as well. So it's very difficult when we are trying to re reach out a hand of friendship and trying to work with other people to, to just have the door slammed in your face. So it has been hugely frustrating. Um, something uh, I meant to say uh, uh, to answer uh, um, to the last question was about Section 30 and independent referendum. Theresa May, two weeks ago, at Prime Minister's question, said that Scot Scotland didn't have a mandate for another independence referendum. And it's worth, worth actually reiterating that we absolutely do, because the Scottish Parliament elections in 2016 were, were fought on that basis. And actually, the SNP's manifesto had a line in it saying we hold the right to, to have another, Scottish, another independence referendum. In the, in the event of a material change of circumstances, such as Scotland been dragged out of the EU against its will. Yeah. Here we are. So I'll pass to Philip and she can maybe take the second one. Well, just a wee bit on the first one. I've been part of a 
cross-party group in Westminster since last September. Um, there was one amendment we got onto the trade customs bill, which was trying to push it to at least be government policy to try and remain in the European Medicines Agency. And it was Philip Lee, Sarah Wallace, and Paul Williams and myself, all doctors, and it very quickly became known as the Doctors' Amendment. And we were trying to do the same on the basis that the short campaign, the lies that were told in 2016, the money that was spent, which completely breaks, breaks the rules, Cambridge Analytica, etc. We as doctors, and I certainly as a surgeon, would not consider it informed consent that people had then. So this is a group who've been trying to get the opportunity for people to have a people's vote, to have uh, a, a chance to say, now that we know an awful lot more about what Brexit will mean for us as individuals or families or professions, is this still what people want to do? Now, of course, I would echo what Carol said. Scotland voted to remain very clearly the last time. That's what my job is to represent. But I've been working with people from every party. Ian Blackford set up a group last year. The only party leader not there, other than Theresa May, was Jeremy Corbyn. He wouldn't take part in it. And you saw that after PMQs, he went to that meeting, which was meant to be all the leaders of the opposition, and, and he stormed out because Chuka Muno is in the room. Um, I mean, actually, behind the scenes, quietly trying to find ways through this, trying to get opportunities to stop the worst of Brexit. There have been people, so I've been working with people like Dominic Grieve, Sarah Wallace, and Anna Subri, etc., cetera, um, for, for months and months. So there is actually a lot of cross-party working. And in actual fact, the, the kind of Tory and Labour is, is almost not the division in Parliament now. The Tory party is split in three chunks, the Labour party is split in about two chunks. So in actual fact, the party uh, system isn't working around Brexit anyway, because people have very strong feelings for or against Brexit. Um, but we are trying to work cross-party. The problem is we're now coming to the boil. And, and I tell you, it's like living in an Indiana Jones film, where you have to walk over the slabs with a lava underneath. But he had the advantage, there were like symbols on them that he could work out. On, on our slabs, there's nothing. So you have absolutely no idea what move you make that you think would be helpful, and then suddenly we're all in the lava. So it's actually incredibly stressful at the moment because the stakes are so high. And don't think any MP is being flippant about this. No matter what side of the argument, no matter what party they're in, there's no doubt that people are, are really trying to, to, to find a way through it. With regards to European elections, obviously they have given, if the deal passes, an extension to the 22nd of May, which is the night before the elections. Although Theresa May asked for the 30th of June, the Europe was adamant that that would be totally against their constitutional setup where all European citizens have to have representation in the Parliament. And that puts an additional pressure that if the deal falls, which frankly it looks like, I mean, and, and it's not whether it's falling because I'm not voting for it, the kind of European research group that people thought might now get on board her deal when there was an urgent question the other night on, on Wednesday night after she had made her statement, I can tell you they were all standing up saying no way. So I, it might get a little bit closer, but I mean it's, you know, it lost by 150 votes. It is, it is not anywhere close uh, to, to getting through. So by the 12th of April, the UK would need to decide if they were going for a long extension, in which case they then have to move the legislation to call their European, the, the European elections here. The Scottish government is already telling local authorities to be ready to hold European elections, because obviously uh, that could be happening, and we might not know until the 12th of April. And then we would have a very short campaign of four or five weeks, but it is not considered acceptable in Europe to have people who are in the EU, a whole population who are not represented in the European Parliament. And it'd be absolutely vital that Scotland sent a strong team to Europe because in many ways people will be looking at us. Remember the embarrassment last time? We elected a UK a kipper. We elected a kipper from Scotland. I mean, toe curlingly embarrassing. 
if we do fight these elections, we're going to have to take them enormously seriously because they are going to be our ambassadors moving forward. They will be talking to European leaders and they'll be listening closely to Scotland's voice. If the reason that Mr Coburn got in was because the turnout in the 2014 European elections was just over 30%. So he won 10% of the vote and was therefore elected on 3%. I would hope all the discussion about Europe means that we would see a proper turnout. And certainly what I would say is to anyone here who wants to see a different direction around Brexit, if we are in the European elections, for goodness sake, go out and vote. Sorry, sorry, just when you kept mentioned, I, I just thought that as a, a light-hearted aside, I would tell you a story from the general election in 2015, um, and we had almost every polling station covered, but in one of the polling stations there were two UKIP activists outside handing out leaflets, and most people were ignoring them, some people were shouting um, some, some friendly Glasgow banter towards them. <laughs> anyway, finally, we just, we just left them to it, but... Um, Finally, one, one of the locals came out and said, Oh, you two, has nobody told you you don't have a candidate here? <laughs> which, which was the case. So. I, um, I got to interview Nigel Farage in my talk radio show two weeks ago. I was explaining how simple Bre Brexit would have been if only he'd been in charge <laughs> of it. And um, I, I found myself saying to him, you know, I know that line works, you know, with your gammon mates down at the Billericay dog and duck. But in the real world of negotiating in Brussels, these fantasies that you have, they just don't wash with people like Mr. Barney. Uh, they, just, they, just, they just work with your mates down in the pub. He didn't shake my hand at the end of the interview. He seemed quite cross. Uh, for some reason. Um, fabulous Eastern Barbenture contingent uh, right there in the middle, of course. Hello, Janice Donaldson, Bearsden South SNP, and yes, Bearsden. <laughs> um, I want to follow on with uh, Eugene's question about Section 30, because I think it's a very serious one. I think that no matter whether it's our Mrs. May or one of her ilk, whenever they're asked if we can have another second referendum, it will be no, now's not the time. I have an idea, I don't know whether it floats, but if we were to have a general election and the parties who want independence, not just the SNP, but the Greens, were to say that if you vote for us, your vote will mean that you're voting for Scottish independence. Is that a possibility? That's what Mrs. Thatcher used to say. Mrs. Thatcher used to say a majority of SNP MPs elected to the House of Commons is a mandate for independence. I think, I think we're almost out of time, aren't we? So I'll take, I'll take one more question, I think. Um, um, my name's Ariel Killick. Um, I was actually speaking at uh, the Berlin Rally um, on Saturday, and I have actually um, a fairly serious question um, in relation to Nigel Farage and also where we are in the UK, and particularly for women who, or anybody really, but particularly for women who are holding off on getting involved in any sort of advocacy whatsoever, particularly if any, and I'm really worried if any of their advocacy, whether you're just doing stuff at a store on the street, or whether, like me and other people, you've taking the step to actually start speaking in, in public at rallies. Um, uh, just, I think, uh, on the 20th, which was Wednesday, Nigel Farage put out a, treat, a tweet um, summing up his daily, uh, his Telegraph article saying, if Th Theresa May buckles and delays Brexit, I will do my best to tear Conservatives limb from limb. They will deserve no better. Turns out the actual full title of his Telegraph article is um, I would do my best to tear her party limb from limb. But that um, clarification isn't made clear in his actual tweet. And he's just put out a major uh, tweet about his leave, leads, uh, means leave rally, about delay means betray. Uh, but particularly about talking about I will tear conservatives, actual human people, limb from limb, does that qualify under incitement to violence or, or hatred? 
Um, and, and can that be taken up? Because that broader thing, that feeds back into people who are considering going forward in public advocacy for independence in Scotland. And I'm, I, I suppose, and then people need to know that this is what this is very, very quickly turned into an incredibly dangerous yeah. demagogue. Quite several he is a demagogue, and he's he's up to, he's he's up to revolting. And is there a sadder <laughs> sight than those um, thirty or forty poor folk who are marching down through country lanes as Farage takes fifty quid off each of them, and then he jets off? He then, he, that was the organisational fee, that's what they all paid, 50 quid. Didn't cover insurance, it turned out. Public liability told them they would have to take out individual public liability. I'm sure all of us have public liability policies ourselves, don't we? You know, I thought not. Um, so he jets off to Brussels for his expenses and is down in London in the pub, photographed in the pub as that poor lot are marching south in the rain. Could there be anything more pitiful? I think not. Uh, so we've got two... Two, two questions uh, there. Janice's question about whether or not there's a mandate for independence. And I'll take one more as well, to be fair. That gentleman there. Janice's question about uh, is a majority of uh, pro independence MPs a mandate? And what can we do about what the Americans call fighting talk in politics? And your question, sir? My name is John Finlayson. I don't have any political association other than a cross on a box for the SNP. I think. Jeremy Corbyn is a communist, but doesn't have the guts to stay so. And as for Theresa May or any leader of the future Tory party, she abused MPs through the week. When this goes belly up, the Tory party will blame the people, say we just did what you voted for. They're stockpiling drugs. They're stockpiling drugs. I have no doubt that in the weeks to come, they will have to start stockpiling food. They want the country back. I perceive it as they want it back post-war 1940s, when we still had rationing. I fail to see how in a modern world with the size of supermarkets, you're ever going to get enough people to queue to do any rationing. Okay, thank you, sir. Do you know the month where we import the most food is? March. 70 plus percent of our food imported from the European Union in March. So obviously that's when Theresa decided uh, to uh, have Brexit. Uh, Dr. Philippa. Well, actually, the, the reason that the Article 50 was launched and therefore the Brexit day is the end of next week uh, was largely driven by the fact that the Europe is introducing tax reforms the following week to try and uh, stamp out tax avoidance. Uh, I mean, I hope that we're not talking about rationing uh, and food shortages. I would, however, suggest if you grow anything, make sure you grow <laughs> as much as you can. What we have heard from Matt Hancock, who is actually even worse than Jeremy Hunt. I never thought I would say that, but he is. And Jeremy Hunt actually managed to insult foreign governments even more than Boris did. Because even when Boris did it, they just laughed because they thought he was crazy. When Jeremy Hunt calls uh, the EU a Soviet gulag, says that Slovenia was behind the Iron Curtain, or can't remember whether his wife comes from China or Japan, uh, they actually do feel insulted. Um, but. The, the thing is, I, I hope we're not going to be talking about that, but Matt Hancock has talked about that precedence would be given to medicines rather than food from the point of view of, of, of importing. Uh, they have talked about we will have to change our diets. So this idea that we can all buy tomatoes all the time and you know a range of bright colorful foods and this kind of stuff, you know we may need to go back to um, haggis, neeks and tatties uh, o over the next year if we face a no deal. It is clear in the House of Commons that there's an absolute majority against a no deal. We have voted on the issue twice. So there's no question that MPs will be doing their best to find a way through without going off the cliff, um, with, without a deal. With regards to the way women are treated um, within politics and within public life, unfortunately this is something that people face Women have faced this in politics for years. I mean, in 2014, I had no intention of doing this. This was not a career plan 
for me. Uh, you know, if you cut me through the middle, it's still going to say doctor. And I remember Joan McAlpine showing me a tweet, threatening her with rape, saying, I know where you live, and mentioning her street, and saying, I know where your daughter goes to school. And I just looked at that and thought, okay, I couldn't do that. And, and, and I get it, and actually I don't get much of it. I get off quite lightly with aggressive language and so on. But there's no question that, that women get a rougher deal. You look at Diane Abbott and what she gets both for her gender and her skin color and how she is talked to. But the thing is, I think more and more women are banding together to support each other, to try and bring more women into politics because that then gives a, a solidarity. And that exists in the House of Commons across parties. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me when I went down is the only thing you see of Westminster is PMQs. It is my most loathed 45 minutes of the week. It is completely staged, it is completely punch and duty, and it is utterly miserable. If I can find an excuse not to be there, I'll go and do something else. We actually spend a lot of our time on select committees, on all party groups, chairing round tables, where you are looking after other people. I'm the most senior medic in the House of Commons, and people who are not well come to me, no matter what party they're from. So, you know, we do look after each other. When Paula Sheriff was in tears, because she'd had yet another death threat, you know, there were women of all parties who were trying to comfort her. So I think it is important that more women come forward because that actually makes them feel safer and stronger. That was one of the reasons why Women for Independence was set up, because it was very noticeable in early debates that once the men got hold of the microphones, the women <laughs> never got a look in. And they were often afraid to ask a question. Is it a stupid question? Will people laugh at me? Will people mock me? And so, um, so that actually really changed the whole tenor of the thing. We had women-only meetings where we could have tea and cake, which is always a good start in life, and that we could have conversations with each other. And that's really important. And just finally, touching on the Section 30 versus a general election. In my mind, once you've had a referendum where every single vote expresses people's wish, a general election is a whole notch below that. But I do think that we all have to be prepared that we may have to go through a snap general election before we would ever get a Section 30 order or whatever other mechanism there is. And at that, we need to be able to show voices and be clear that that general election is fought on Scotland's wish to run its own future. You look at the mess of the last two and a half years. We're not asking to sail off into the sunset. We're not leaving England and Wales. We just simply want to make our own decisions. And I don't think we could make worse decisions that we made in the last two now. Right, I'm going to ask Carol to respond very quickly to the excellent point made there by Ariely. And um, then we've got a few questions that we've been sent in. And because we're very short of time, we'll do those as a quick snap fire round of answers. Carol. Thanks very much. I, I want to talk particularly about women in politics and the experience of it. Um, my first death threat came about two years ago uh, when I dared to speak out against Donald Trump. Um, I, I wasn't too worried because it was, they were coming from the American Deep South. Uh, one, one of them uh, called me all sorts of names and said, Australia should be ashamed. <laughs> I think, I think his name was Randy, which seemed, seemed about right. Um, but seriously, at the moment with the Brexit, I mean, I said earlier civic unrest, that's, that's, that's me being tongue in cheek, maybe civic demonstration um, and uh, being, being, being able to talk out freely, um, go and protest march, stand up for what you believe, it's so important. But that's got to be done in a respectful way. My, I have um, currently, I, my office has been the target of some right-wing activism. The police are involved, but it is ongoing. So, so yes, yes, it is a very real thing. But if women say we're not going to get involved because of the threat, 
it becomes a bigger problem. We, we have to be involved, we have to be central to this, or the threat will just continue. They've won if we, don't, if we give up at that point. Okay, now uh, these are the questions we've been sent in uh, from uh, Independence Live and Indie Live Radio. Uh, the first one is for uh, Dr. Philippa. What do you mean uh, by free personal care? My mother in law had to sell her a house to pay for the care. And that comes from Mick. Well, free personal care is you're getting washed, you're getting dressed, you're getting out of bed, etc taking your tablets. If you are in a care home, so you have accommodation costs there, then that costs money. So it's the free personal care. And if you are in a nursing home, then that free personal care part of your nursing home charge is still paid for by the <coughs> Scottish Government. And they pay a certain proportion of any nursing care that you need, whether at home or in a, a, in a care home. But yes, if you are living in a care home, then obviously they expect you to be paying towards that accommodation. Now, it's a lot cheaper to stay at home, and because they have doubled the hours that people can have, there's a higher level of dependency among patients who can still manage to be at home now. The, the, the amount of time that can be allocated to someone is twice. But if they're in a care home, then yes. If they are uh, wealthy, if they have a house, then yes, that may well be so. Um, my mum was diagnosed with dementia uh, very recently and uh, she worked in the post office until she was 80. So um, every time she got to the age of 65, she would go to a different sub-post office and say she was 55 and do another 10 years. And she kept this going until she was 80 and she eventually got caught because they introduced the computer uh, exams and um, the post office postmistress failed the exam and my mum passed. <laughs> so they said to my mum aged 80, uh, you'll have to take over on Monday. And of course my mum's national insurance number is written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So she said, okay, see you on Monday. And she never went back. Anyway, <clears throat> she's, um, she's been diagnosed very recently with dementia and she's doing fine, really. But you know, she's getting four daily visits from carers. Because you know, Cordia, which is the kind of privatised company has been disbanded. The SNP Glasgow government has taken over. It's all gone back in-house again. The level of care is extraordinary. Four daily visits. She's a social worker who comes up. She's a psychiatrist who comes up to visit her. Um, she gets this amazing meals service as well from volunteers. Uh, if you tell people south of the border that we have this level of care, they just can't begin to imagine it. They're flabbergasted when I tell my English friends about it. Um, Carol, these next two questions I'll amalgamate. Uh, they're from you. Uh, this is from Roddy McNeil, who's watching from the French Alps. Look at, look at Roddy. Um, so Roddy wants to... <laughs> it, and if you're going to do it, do it quickly, because otherwise, otherwise it will only be paid for. Um, so uh, Roddy... And the next two questions I've got are both about how we handle the media and get our message across. And Roddy, is, Roddy says that uh, people in Scotland don't realise how much worse the English NHS is, how much worse uh, government from Westminster on health is. What is stopping the SNP in particular from launching a nationwide leafleting campaign publicising this message? And we've also got another question along the same kind of lines, which is, when is the SNP and the Scottish Government going to have a more robust and effective PR machine against the drip drip of falsehoods? Carol, that's something I hear all the time from people who say, and I know Alistair, Cam I know Alistair Campbell, and I remember, I used, to I used to present BBC Breakfast, and Alistair Campbell would have the telephone number of the gallery the director's gallery. I'd managed to find out the numbers of all the galleries. And if he didn't like an interview, he would be on the phone to my producer or editor to complain about the tenor of the debate. Are we tough enough in rebutting falsehoods in the media? Um, in, in a word, I, <laughs> I don't think we are. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to get that message out in the media. 
I do think the new BBC Scotland channel has been a lot better and if any of you have watched the Nine News, I find that far better. It's more relaxed, the pace is better, there is more time for discussion and different points of view to be explored. So I found that far better. But if we're relying on a media that's generally right wing to get our message out, we're going to struggle. We've already said the importance of talking to each other and that's, that's vital. That's how we got a lot of the messages out in 2014. That's how we went from 26% support for independence to 45% support. It certainly wasn't with the media's help. In terms of leafleting campaign, it's happening now. We're delivering leaflets now, so it, was that the, the guy in the Alps? Uh, the, the guy in the Alps. So, so maybe, <laughs> maybe if he wants to ski over here, he can give us a hand. That'd be helpful. You know, Dr. Philip had mentioned earlier on that there's cross-party cooperation at Westminster that you don't often see. So I sat in the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Now, you've no idea how much the Scottish Tories and Gordon Brown hate the idea of a separate Scottish news programme. They fought it and they fought it and they fought it. And what I did was I brought the committee up to Eastern Bartonshire. We had a wee afternoon out, took them to the city chambers, went out for a tea together, and every single member of the select committee, Tory and Labour alike, voted for a separate Scottish news programme. And the Scottish Tories, when they heard the news, they were like chameleons in a tartan rug. They didn't know where to turn because they wanted to attack me. But that would, that would have meant attacking their Tory colleagues who voted for it. Turco Crichton wrote a whole page in the Daily Record how on earth John Nicholson managed to persuade them to vote for a separate Scottish news hour. I wanted a separate Scottish six. Instead, we got a separate Scottish nine. It's a proper, it's a proper programme. What it does is it places Scottish news in the context of European, UK and world news instead of the Cuthie reporting Scotland. Because at the moment with Rep Scott, a nuclear bomb could fall in Carlisle and they'd lead with an air show in Carluc. It's a bit of nonsense. It's regional and pitiful. But I think the, I think the Scottish nine is well worth watching. Dr Philippa, last word to you. Well, I think that it, I think the media is is a big issue, but we've got um, indie life here. What we have seen, not just the the national, the newspaper, but we have seen all sorts of grow your own broadcasting through the internet that has come up over the last five years. Broadcasting Scotland, um, you know, I mean, there's really a whole lot of different ones. There's just frankly too many to to mention. The, the films that Leslie Riddick made, if you haven't seen those, they are inspiring. I mean, I had a tear in my eye when I watched Norway. So we're kind of starting to do it for ourselves, which allows you to talk to a few more people. But it is still the case that, you know, after the referendum, I had friends who voted no, and one who regretted that she voted no. Oh, why, why did you not say that? Why did we not know that? It's like trying to get through a brick wall to get things out. And, and I think it's important that we support the new BBC Scotland channel. You know, it'll take a while for them to get the rhythm on everything. But if people are watching it and are talking about it, and it actually becomes the normal news that people watch, rather than BBC and Reporting Scotland, then exactly as John says, it's our viewpoint out to the world. You know, at the moment we get everything siphoned through London. Well, we have a different view of Europe. We see ourselves as Europeans. We've always seen ourselves as Europeans. We see ourselves as a small, rural, dynamic nation within Europe. And that's not what we're ever going to get through the kind of London media. So I think it's important if we want these medias to grow and survive and be our channels in the future, we have to support them. And some of them, like Indie Live, they need you to actually make a wee donation. You know, people are doing this as volunteers or, you know, along with their jobs. So try and support them, try and watch them. If you're not buying the National, it won't exist. NewsQuest isn't doing it because they support independence. They publish the Herald and they have orientated that more and more and more towards people who are anti-independence and they consider we've got the National and that's fine, we can go and play in the corner. But if you remember what we would have given in 2014, to have had a newspaper 
that was on the newsstands with those amazing front pages that the National does. Never forget, and that's the importance of paper. Don't go for the digital version. It's that sitting on the shelf that somebody notices as they go to the till yeah. to buy something else when it is a big block headline. It's absolutely critical. So the, the media situation now is quite different from 2014, but we all need to get behind and support our online media, digital media, social media, and what actual paper media we have, because we have to get our voices out there. And of course, um, you know, make your voices heard if you notice that Question Time or any questions or these other programs don't have uh, SNP or Green or other minority representatives on because you know what? We were never off Question Time between 2015 and 2017. I can say that with some experience. And as soon as 2017 came along, that was it. Um, Alan, is, uh, Alan is waving at me. Um, I've got a message here from Roddy from early on, the chap of the French Alps. <laughs> he says, please tell the panel my holiday finishes tomorrow and as I've not broken any bones, I'm glad to help with it. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming along tonight. Uh, it's been a, a fabulous exchange. Um, I think you're all tremendously lucky to have this woman as your MP, Carol Monaghan. She's, she's, never off my, she's never off my radio show, which I use blatantly to, to get uh, like-minded politicians on. Carl talks about space quite often, don't you? And dinosaurs and uh, pointing stone buildings. A basic, any excuse to have her on, I use. And of course, uh, thank you also to uh, Dr. Philippa. Um, thank you to Alan and the whole team at uh, Yes Glasgow Northwest for arranging this. Um, I've also been asked by Alan to say that you're having an event tomorrow night as well, so you want to read plug uh, for that. You can follow that on Glasgow Northwest website, Facebook, and Twitter. Big March tomorrow as well. Uh, against Brexit. I know people from here are going down to march against Brexit in the Imperial capital. So I hope that goes well when you go down there. And, um, and Carol wants to say a few words. Thanks, Sean. Just to thank our two guests once again for speaking. Um, Philippa was talking about the national. Can I say there's another wee trick when you go into a supermarket and there's a pile of nationals? Use them to cover the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> Anyway, if I could just thank, thank every, all of you here tonight. Um, obviously, they didn't consult me as to what John and Philippa's favourite tipple was, but it seems they got it quite right. So if I could say, first of all, Philippa, thank you very much. This is Marta Glasgow Gin. And John, I don't know if you've tried it, but thank you very much. And thanks all of you here tonight. And thanks to Indy Live for broadcasting as well. Yeah. And Indy Live Radio. And see you home, everybody. One last time before you go. Could you stay in your places or stand up?